I'm always blessed on uh, when when the time change Sundays come. Uh, for those of you that are that that make your way, you fight through the uh, lack of an extra hour of sleep or lack of an hour of sleep, and and you're here. And uh, I I thank the Lord for you, and I thank you for being here and uh, worshiping the Lord uh, together with us. Uh, God is so good to us, Amen. And uh, we're we're wonderfully blessed to be able to open His Word together. And so would you please turn with me in the scripture to the uh, first chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippian church, uh, chapter 1. And while you're, while you're turning there, we again want to welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, being here. If you're a guest, please fill out a guest card and uh, give it to one of the ushers following the service. We have refreshments for everyone in the foyer uh, after the service. And... Um, Maybe an extra cup of hot tea or coffee will help you today, uh, but, but that'll be after the service. Uh, the Spanish language service is tonight at 5. Uh, prayer meeting is tonight and every night at 6.30, and you're welcome to that. Uh, and Holy Week begins in only two weeks from today, uh, which is kind of hard to believe that we've already uh, gone that far into 2018. But Palm Sunday is in two weeks. Good Friday, we have two special services for you, so... Uh, and then Easter Sunday is on April 1st. So if you would just uh, uh, look in your bulletin and take note of all the various things that are going on, uh, we would appreciate that. Yeah. It's been a wonderful weekend. Uh, the ladies' ministry had a, had a wonderful brunch uh, yesterday, and, uh, and, and uh, they, they invited me to it, um, but refused to feed me. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I, I had to, I had to run to my granddaughter's birthday party, but it was, it was a, uh, it was a wonderful time of fellowship for the sisters. And then Friday night we had a wonderful baptism service uh, here in, in in the cathedral, and so the Lord's just blessing us in, in many ways, and for that we're we're so grateful. Paul the apostle told the Philippian believers, he said, "I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you." I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Say that phrase with me aloud together, please. Your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Would you please uh, join with me for a word of prayer? Father, we love you. And we are grateful that we can open your word together. We ask in Jesus' precious name that you would speak to us today through your word, that your spirit would anoint us, that you would anoint me to speak your words, editing from me those things that might be my opinion or my contrived attitude or thought. And Lord, release those things that are your word today. I would also ask, Father, that you give everybody in this house ears to hear, what the Spirit is saying to the church. And Lord, as we stop and pause and consider your instructions for this particular congregation, uh, moving forward, Lord, should you tarry, would you give us a sense of courage and a sense of hope, and that, Lord, we would have courage sufficient to the task, and that we would be obedient servants in your house, doing as you have commanded and following through on that which you've laid in front of us. We love you for these things. We thank you for the privilege to serve you. We do not take it lightly. And Lord, we pray for, a, 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 I pray, Lord, just for a sense of, of, of holy expectation this morning. Uh, Lord, I know everybody's probably a little bit more tired than normal, and, and it's been a busy week and the time change and everything else. Uh, but Lord, just remove that from our equation today. And give us several minutes where we can, we can hear your voice. And for that, I'm very grateful, Father, in Jesus' precious name. And those who agreed said together, Amen. Amen. Paul speaks of a partnership in the gospel. And this is a, a partnership not only between us, we're in this together, but it's a partnership between heaven and earth. Uh, the ministry is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's his ministry. And so we have been called uh, to do his ministry. 
And we've been called to do it in his love. And we've been called to do it for his glory. And we've been called to do it by his power. And he's the one who begins the good work. He's the one who completes the good work. He's the one who sustains it. He's the one who carries it on. He's the one who gives instruction as to what to do. He's the one who gives instruction as to how to do it. Um, so you and I, we, we, we participate with him. But as, as Jesus said in John 15, uh, you know, he's the vine and we're the branch. And, and, and taking that analogy, you know, just visually in your mind for a moment, re remind yourself, please, that in, in, a, in a great vineyard, which is the, the concept of what the Lord's talking about there, uh, the branches bear fruit, but they only bear fruit as they're attached to the vine. Okay, so you don't, you don't have fruit born down there by the root structure, which is where the real strength is, and that's, what's, that's what survives all winter, uh, is, is that vine, okay? The fruit is born by the, by the small, kind of, kind of frail branches, and, 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 and the fruit is beautiful, and the fruit is tasty, and the fruit is sweet, and all of those wonderful things, but only as it's connected to the vine. And this is the way of the kingdom of God. God has sovereignly decreed that he will do the work of his ministry through us. But we're vessels of clay. We're vessels that are fragile. We're vessels that break a lot. We're vessels that don't, don't do so well. Uh, and, and we can't survive on our own. Okay, so only as we're connected to the nutrient flow of the spirit of God can we actually bear fruit. But... We do bear fruit. And that's, that's all to the glory of the Lord. And, and it's, all, it's all to the honor of the Lord. But, but here's one of the things that we must guard against. And that is this notion that any of this belongs to us. None of it belongs to us. This building doesn't belong to us. These chairs, these pews don't belong to us. Nothing belongs to us. And so we have no right to territoriality. We have no right to self-aggrandizement. We have, we have no right to, to anything that perpetuates our name. We're called to perpetuate his name. And, and, and the danger, and C.S. Lewis talked about this in Mere Christianity. Uh, you know, the moral code of the church from the outside looking in, the moral code looks like we're very concerned about, about you know, sexual sins, and we're very concerned about habitual sins, and we're very concerned about things that are easily defined, uh, you know, and, and, and we are concerned about those things. But that's not the center of the moral code of the church. The center of the moral code of the church is that the I am the biggest idol I know. And so all those other terrible sins, and they are, are born out of the sin of self. Pride is such a horrible thing that it turned a glorious angel into Satan. That's how horrific pride is. That's how horrific self-aggrandizement is. That's how horrific idolatry is. All other things flow out of that, which is why all ministry flows out of worship. Because worship is the emptying of the self. It is the emptying of the I. It is the emptying of the idolatry. And it is the elevating of the Christ. So all ministry, all power flows out of glory, the glory to the Christ. And so we, we've been talking about these things, and I, I don't want to spend a, 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 any more time on, on it than to just kind of re, reframe that. This is his work. Okay, so uh, let's, let's, let's cover what we've talked about real quickly. The great promise of Jesus, number one in your notes on the back of your bulletin, is that I'll build my church. And he will. And he is. And he does. And you know what? I, I'll tell you right now. When things are going poorly, I know it's probably because of me. And when things are going well, I know it's in spite of me. 
And that's not me being cavalier or, or facetious or anything else. I've just, you know, I've been at this for 36 years now. That's the way it is. When it's going well, it's in spite of me. When it's going poorly, I've probably fouled up somewhere and need to repent of something. That's just kind of the way it is. But no matter what, the church moves forward. No matter what, God's kingdom advances. No matter what, the king of kings is doing his work. No matter what, the lamb is engaging the adversary in spiritual warfare. No matter what, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And, and it's all to God's glory. Okay, That's his promise. His commandment and his commission leave for us an understanding of his vision. Okay, this is his intention for the church, is that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus said all of the law and all of the prophets hang on these two commandments. Matthew 28 is his great commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. So these two passages leave us the vision. Number three in your notes, the vision of the Lord for his church. It's macro. It's universal. Every part of the body of Christ is to love God. So every part of the body of Christ is to worship. Every part of the body of Christ is to love our neighbor. So every part of the body of Christ is to engage in ministry, which means to serve. Every part of the body of Christ is to go and make disciples, evangelizing the lost. Every part of the body of Christ is to baptize them. And that was part of the beauty of Friday night services. We got to talk about, again, ordinances of the church. And an ordinance is something instituted by Christ, practiced by the, well, Hello. <laughs> I hope that was a holy bird. <laughs> I, I, now, if I were a mystical person, I'd go, oh, look at the symbolism. The beautiful hummingbird came in while I was preaching. Of course, hummingbirds are notoriously territorial and mean. So <laughs> But every part of the body of Christ is to engage in winning the lost and to engage that, the lost into the incorporation of fellowship. And water baptism says, I was lost, I'm now found. I was dead, I'm now alive. I have been dead, buried, and raised in Christ Jesus. And all the body walks through the waters of baptism. That's, that's the beauty of it. That's one of the glorious parts of it. And then training. Every part of the body of Christ is to teach men and women to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, our job is to take the raw material of a dead soul and train them to be alive and following Jesus. That's the church. So every part of the body does these five things. Then... We get down to the unique mission. And this is what we began talking about last Sunday. And I, I want to get through quite a bit of this this morning. Don't ask for whom the bell tolls. <laughs> the, the, the bell tower is not on daylight savings time yet. That's what's happening. <laughs> I promise, Rich doesn't go back there and pull a string. There's a computer to this. <laughs> so, number four in your notes. In addition to the universal vision of the Lord for his church, he's given a unique mission for each congregation. Okay? So, hopefully, I've emphasized this point enough this year. All the body does the five things we've just talked about. But there's unique things that each congregation does. All right? One of the illustrations John Wimber gave years ago was, was the idea of a bus. And so if you imagine here in, here in Oakland, we, we have the, the, the transit authority and you, 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 you take the bus. And if you're trying to cover a whole city, you, have, you don't have one bus. You have a bus line, you have a bus company, but you don't have one bus. Okay? And different buses go to different places with 
in the town. And so if you get on the bus that's going to Merritt College, but you want to but you want to go down to Jack London Square, you can get on the bus and you can yell at the driver all that you want. I want to go to Jack London. That's fine, but we're going to Merritt College. No, I want to go to Jack London. Then get on the Jack London bus. But isn't this a bus? Yes, it's a bus. Does it not have four wheels? Yes. Does it not have a driver? Yes. Does it not have room for passengers? Yes. It's got all the, it's, it, all buses got bus stuff. All churches got church stuff. But not all buses are going to the exact same place. Ultimately, they are back to the yard. And hopefully, we're all going back to the yard, okay? But during the work day, some buses are going to Merritt College, some buses are going to Montclair, some buses are going to East Oakland, some buses are going to, to Jack London Square. And if you want to be one that goes to one of those places, you got to get on the right bus. Does that make sense? That's what mission is for a church. Mission for a church is these are the things the Lord has told us to do. We don't do what the Salvation Army does. And if you come in here and you start yelling at the pastor, I want to do what they do. You know what I'm going to tell you. That's a different bus. Oh, amen? Okay. <laughs> Looking at me like, he needs to sleep, okay? <laughs> because the fact is, we have to do what the Lord has told us to do as a congregation. Now, he's told all of us to worship, evangelize, minister, fellowship, and train. Absolutely. But then there are things that we do that are unique. There are things that Acts Full Gospel does that are unique. There are things that Alan Temple does that are unique. There, there are things that Pastor Marco is doing up the street that are unique. And we bless all of them. We love all of them. Because you know what? Just like the bus line has to have several buses to cover the city, you've got to have several churches, several congregations to cover all the needs in our community. Not one church, not one pastor is equipped to do that because... because the Lord knows us, frankly. We'd get a little too prideful, and then the ministry would, would fall on its face. And he wants the ministry to go forward. And so the Lord does this in a wonderful way, so we all get to participate. This is the work of the kingdom of God. This is the way of, 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 our, of our king. So the, univer the vision is universal and macro. The mission is unique and micro. Under the inspiration of the Spirit, the Lord gives direction to the scope and to the how of what we do. Romans 1, we all need to have a sense of obligation to the people in our culture, to people in other cultures, to the educated and the uneducated alike. We need to, we need to have a sense of obligation to reach our community. And we need to do everything we do in love. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. His love has the first and last word in everything we do. So we began last Sunday talking about strategic pathways. We have entered a, a, a time that, that I've, I, I've just called the Genesis years because they're, they're a season of beginning. We, we've gone through a season and a period where we had existential crisis. And no, that season's over. It doesn't mean we don't have problems. We do. We always will. <laughs> At least as long as I'm here. We always will, okay? <laughs> but we don't, we don't have existential crises right now, okay? Big problems, enormous battles, some of them are, are, are battles that the enemy brings our way. Some of them are, all, are battles that we choose to engage the enemy in, and that's how it should be. And, and no, no battle is, is ever, ever won without a fight, and no, no victory ever comes without difficulty. None of that bothers us, okay? The difference is we're not in a season of existential crisis. We're in a season of new beginnings. And so we have five years, and 10% of that is, is, is a down payment on the 50. And, and so just as the books of Moses began the scriptures, began the word of God, and out of those things flowed so many other things that, that maybe even Moses could not have imagined, so too you and I have the privilege of being part of five years right now that allow us to, to begin to see the different flow of God's grace that we won't even begin to imagine. I can tell you from... from uh, internally, and I, and I think Dr. Mantra and the board and others would agree with this, stuff is happening now that we couldn't have foreseen five years ago. 
in a good way, in a glorious way. And it's all because of God's grace. It's not that we're, you know, it's God's grace and frankly that 6.30 prayer meeting and uh, uh, every, every night. And, and that, that, that's the engine of this place is that 6.30 prayer meeting. And so we, we see God doing that. We believe God is, is doing that. So we, 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 we're entering this, this, this time of, of, of expansion, this time of setting pathway and setting the framework for expansion of the work and extension of the kingdom. And so in that comes this idea of lanes. And I shared with you last Sunday, that, you know, I'm from Los Angeles. And so, you know, freeways are like, like home to me. And so uh, for good and for bad. And so... The freeway consists of like what we would call the concrete and the gravel and all, all of that. The freeway consists of, of, of all the elements of the church. The large pathways, worship, evangelism, training, uh, fellowship, incorporation, ministry. Okay, that's, that's all. But then there, there are specific pathways. If you go to the next slide, please. It's hard to see, but I've also put it in your, in your, in your, uh, in, in your notes in the bulletin. These are the five lanes right now. Now, my, my prayer is that our children and our grandchildren, maybe even we get to expand it and add some lanes, okay? But right now, these are the, the, the kind of the, the five lanes that we're running on, okay? And there, there's a sixth, but it's not a lane. And that's, that's the business and administration. So we'll talk about that, maybe not today, but we'll, we'll get to that eventually too. But these are the, the, the definition of the lanes of our mission. And that's what I want you to see. It's sort of, it's sort of like, uh, you know, again, the bus, getting back to the bus, okay? And the bus, the, the bus has a, a bus, it's got a driver, and it's got that little thing at the top of, on the outside that says, this is where this bus is going. That's kind of what these are, okay? This is, this, is, this is who we are. This is what we're about. These are the things that, 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 are, that are important. And uh, small Roman numeral I in your notes, Education. Education. If you go to the next slide, please. Education is an important part of who we are. Long before I get, got here. Okay, the, the, this, the, the ministry here, and we, we kind of reviewed some of the history of it last time. But, but this ministry was born in revival, and I'm going to get to that in a few minutes as well. But it was born in revival, but the, the, the putting down of roots began with, with an educational mission. Training men and women uh, for, for spiritual service. Training men and women for ministry. And, and Dr. Patton, uh, in the 40s, began this. One of the things I love when, that we do is, is uh, Sister Sharon uh, will put up you know, the banners from all the, the Patton University, Patton College, Oakland Bible Institute. Uh, and, we, and, and a couple times a year, I, I love to have them up. And, they, and they're usually celebrating and commemorating something that, along those lines. But I love because we always start over here. And I, I look back at those early banners. And it just reminds me. And some of you in this, in this house even today are from those really early schools things. It's part of who we are. It's, it's, it's ingrained in the DNA of this place. And so we are willing to spend a huge sum of money on education. Patent Academy is critically low in the amount of money we charge for tuition because we want to serve the community. It's, it, is, it is literally six times less money than the school my son works at charges for tuition. Literally. And we're, we commit to that. We commit to education. We commit to education here in the Fruitville. But we want to expand upon that. We're very blessed by the way the Lord has honored Pace with WASC accreditation. The secular community acknowledges it. The secular community says our Christian ethos in, in, in the school. You, you, you come to the Friday night service, and there's a, it's a worship service. It's Pace families. It's, it's children. It's students. It's faculty. It's, it's, it's young people. 
you know, in their school uniforms, playing in the orchestra. Uh, it, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful expansion. But we are our ministry of this place. But we want to expand it. We, we want to add child care, and, and, which we have, but we also want to add a new preschool. Okay? My prayer is that a family living in the Fruitville... It's a 25-year it's a plan. Now, that's easy. 25 years is easy, right? Okay. That a, a child born today could enter into infant care with us, then go into preschool with us, and then go through K through 12 with us, and then in the higher educational platform with us. Well, guess what that does? You do that enough times with enough kids in the Fruitvale, you change the Fruitvale. You transform it. It takes 25 years, but you transform it. You train them with a Christian ethos. You train them with critical thinking skills. You train them in an atmosphere full of the Holy Spirit, in an atmosphere full of the anointing of God. You give them the disciplines of music. You give them the disciplines of sports. You give them the rigor of academics, and you give them the strongness and the, and the strength of, of, of the Word of God, and suddenly you have brought about community transformation. And if you do that enough time, are we bringing more birds in or is that a new same guy? <laughs> is he nesting in our little tree back here? He's looking for food. Well, don't give him any. I don't want him to stay. <laughs> I know someone on the live stream is wondering, what is wrong with pastor? We have a bird flying about. All right. <laughs> so child care and a new preschool. This is something I want you to begin praying about. I want you to begin asking the Lord for. I, uh, uh, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Mantra are working on that. There's, there's legal requirements, there's facility space, requir all, all that stuff. Uh, but but that's, that's part of who we are. So that's part of who we are. Now again, am I saying that the, what, what, what other works do in dealing with young people is not important? Of course not. It's very important. But this is what we do. This is what we do. This is what we will spend enormous sums of resource to augment and supplement a very low tuition schedule. This is what faculty members take, take less than market value to serve because it's part of the mission. Now, on the business side, our goal is to get uh, in fact, Dr. Mancha reiterated again in a meeting this week, our goal is to get the faculty members up to, to public school standard plus a dollar. We want to be higher paid than the public school. Maybe plus a hundred bucks, but I mean, you know, we want to be higher. But right now, we're working toward that. But it's part of who we are. We have partnerships with charter schools. One of the things that, that we, have, we have a charter school lease right now on the campus that's been a, an incredible benefit to us in terms of the finances and the funding and the resourcing of, of this place because we can, we, we, we can, we can charge fair rental value. And, and because they're a nonprofit, it helps us to do some other things. Plus, there's, there, we're, we're praying about some partnerships with these things. We're looking for an international school of the arts. We want to create an international school of the arts. Let me tell you something else we want to do. And this is very dear to a grandfather's heart here. Okay? We want to have a special needs school. A special needs school and a special needs ministry within this house. For special needs families. the most silent group there is. They cannot advocate for themselves. Someone must advocate for them. And if the church will not, shame on Toby Montgomery. We must. We must. On the higher education side, we want to have a leadership school of community transformation. That includes an honors pathway. This goes back to the charter partnership where kids that are struggling to make it into college. Did you know that Oakland has a horrible, 
deplorable student population when it comes to graduating college. Our high school graduates feel oftentimes very intimidated in college. They don't feel like they belong. They don't feel like they can make it. They don't feel like they can get through that. Uh, uh, Mr. Gene Wade, who you guys met last November, he's created this Honors Pathway program in which you, the, the charter schools, not, 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 uh, not the academy, the charter schools identify students at risk and they put them in there for a 13th year. And, and, and it's intensive tutoring, intensive training. In fact, we, we had one student, because, because a lot of times these, these, these come from challenging home environments, where there was a student that could not make it to class. And that was, that was quote unquote, his excuse. I, could, I couldn't make it there because, because mom's work shift changed, and now she's, she's not there to take me to school in the morning. So, so Mr. Wade called Uber and had Uber waiting at the door the next morning in order to get this child into class, okay? And to just not give them an excuse and not give them a reason to fail. Now, tell me that doesn't fit with who we are. That's a, that, that goes to the core of who this place is. I've seen it personally with my own children. I've seen it personally, how, how this place's education system pours into those children and gives them the ability to do rigorous work. Strong work, powerful work, spiritual work. That's what community transformation looks like. Did you know that, that, that through Patton University, we're still the only ones that go into the prison? San Quentin. That started way back when. Dr. Moncher kept it even when the government gave up Pell funding and everything else. We do that. God's given us that ability. That's community transformation, isn't it? You want to just punish someone or do you want to reform them? That's a whole nother sermon, but I have some strong feelings about, about prison ministry and, and some things we need to be doing and can be doing there. But, but, but this, it flows out of this education. Community transformation is, how about if we train pastors to be disruptive in a good way? How about if pastors not only learn seminary at work, which is, you know, homiletics, hermeneutics, theology, how to preach, how to pastor, how to organize, all that stuff. But what if we give them business degrees? What if we give them law degrees? What if our pastors are so thoroughly equipped and thoroughly trained that they are not intimidated by any politician? They're not intimidated by any businessman. They're not intimidated by any community organization, but they are the community organization. And they are the ones that know how to pull the levers of power because they've been trained thoroughly, not just in the word of God, but in the business of, the, of, 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 of running an organization, organizational leadership, and also in the, way, in the practice of law. Can we do all that? Yes. Yes. You know why? we got 50 years to do it. We can do all this. A pastoral school of leadership, consortium, discipleship ministry. We want, by God's grace, we have an anchor point right now in the church, and that's Sunday morning. That's an anchor point. We want another anchor point. Sunday morning's anchor point is primarily inspirational and vision. We want a, another anchor point during the week that is expository and verse by verse through the whole Bible. So we're, we're working on that. It's going to be called School of the Word. And, but, 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 but we want to not just have something for the adults. We want to have something for the children and for the teens. And, and the, the way that the church council approved it just this week is that what we'll do is we haven't got it worked out yet, but you'll see it and we'll announce it. But... but Imagine if you came on, on a Wednesday or Thursday night and we had dinner for you. Would you say thank you, Pastor, for that? That wasn't really very good. Would you say thank you, Pastor, for that? Okay. okay. <laughs> the idea is we know you all work. 
We know your families are busy. We know our pace kids are, are over there till six o'clock. So the idea is that from six to seven, we have a time of fellowship and a time of a meal. And then at seven o'clock, the children go to, to their classes. The teens go to their classes. Young, young people might go to their, their classes. But then we have Dr. Hannah and Dr. Rebecca and Dr. Moncher and Brother Moncher and, and maybe occasionally Pastor Toby. We go through the six week sessions of the word of God, verse by verse. Now, how would you like Dr. Hannah to teach you on the Old Testament verse by verse. Amen. She'd be through Genesis 1 in about 10 years, I suspect. But <laughs> Dr. Rebecca, the same thing with the New Testament. We're going to take these things that God has given us in education and really dive into some of the discipleship categories of this. This is what we're doing. This is who we are. I have up there 320. I'll talk about that later. But I want you to see some of these other things that God has given to us. Turn to your neighbor and say, we have a lot to do in the educational mission. But there's something else that you guys have done. And these are things I observed when I came here. Number two is pastoral care and nurture ministry. Go to the next slide, please. Pastoral care and nurture the engine of this ministry has always been the prayer ministry. And the prayer ministries are profoundly important here. This is one of the few churches, probably in all of America, certainly in California, that has a daily prayer meeting. Daily. Every day. 6.30 every evening prayer meeting. This is one of the few Protestant ministries that has a prayer chapel that is open at about six or seven in the morning whenever security opens it until after the last prayer meeting and security is shutting down the campus. That prayer chapel is open. You could come by in the middle of your work day and go into that prayer chapel. You don't need an appointment. You don't need a key. You can come by, most of you, on your way to work and come onto campus and go in that prayer chapel. You could go by on your way home and go into that prayer chapel. You can come by every day at 630 and the saints will be in there praying and you could ask them to pray. You can leave a prayer request that we pray over. That's why we have the, the prayer basket. It's not... It's not a, 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 a silliness. It's, it's a real thing to us. These are needs that have come in during the week into that prayer basket, written down, and people pray over them. I've seen people in there, when I've gone into the prayer chapel, they get those needs out and they start opening them and praying before the Lord and pray those needs. We, if you're a member of this church, we, we have a keeping in touch team and they call you. And they ask you, and they leave messages, because I get the message, left message, send pastor's note, send pastor's card if, they, if no one answered. But they will ask you what your need is, and, and, and they'll summarize it. They don't tell anybody else, Reverend Fears and myself. Amen. Okay? And I get a report every month from those people, and I get your name, and here's your request. And I pray over them every month. Reverend Fears prays over them. That prayer team prays over them. Pastoral care and nurture is such a profoundly important part of our ministry that we can't do anything without it. It's who we are. It's one of the things that we do. Reverend Fears, Reverend, Reverend Minerva, Reverend Beebe, uh, 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 Minister Opal and, and others, the, the Lord has given you the ability uh, to, to, to engage in visitation, hospital visitation. I, I mean, I, I remember Reverend Minerva when I, first came, when I first came here. She says, well, tomorrow I'm taking so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so to these doctor's appointments. I'd never heard of a church that took people to doctor's appointments. From the two years between Dr. Patton's passing until I became the pastor here. I, I, you, you, had, you had Dr. Moncher and Dr. Rebecca and, and others in, in the pulpit, and I'm grateful to the Lord for that. But you did not have a lead pastor, but you were not uncared for. The Lord gave you shepherds. He gave you ministers who love you and care about you 
And what Reverend Fears does is, is, is amazing. What Reverend Beebe does is amazing. What Reverend Minerva does is amazing. What others in the, in the pastoral ministries do are amazing. My prayer is that we expand it into parishes, small groups, cell groups, that we expand that care even beyond what Reverend Beebe is doing with the ladies' ministry, what Brother Bruce and, uh, and, and Dr. Abe have done and are going to be doing with the men's ministry, what Dr. Abe's been doing and, Reverend, and Brother Bruce is coming alongside. The chaplaincy, rest homes. Uh, Reverend Fears is a chaplain in rest homes and in hospitals and the prison ministries. Or I want to expand into the prison ministry. Our benevolence ministry. We have an entire fundraiser in the, in the, in the fall of the year just for benevolence. Brother and Sister Mancha and others, we, we, we adopt families in the community. Not even in this house, in the community. Through the benevolence ministries. Community network and partnerships is something that we, we want to expand upon. And, and, and here's an area of ministry that comes into this area that I want us to really look toward. And that's the counseling ministry. A lot of people need deliverance. How many of you know someone today that needs deliverance? Now, you can't counsel that out. But you can give framework and tools to people so they know how to begin to process their healing. And the goal is that at some point in time, they come to the place where they're free of those addictions and those things where the enemy has laid hold of them. In fact, in, in, in prayer service, I'm going to pray for you in just a few minutes, but one of the scriptures that comes to my mind when it comes to this kind of ministry, counseling and health ministry, is John 14, 30. Jesus said, the prince of this world is coming, but he has no hold in me. Okay, the problem with many of us in the body of Christ is that the, the, there's still an alliance in certain areas of our lives that have been unsurrendered to the Lord. The old timers would call it sanctification. Okay, and I still think that's a good word for it, by the way. But, but, but sometimes uh, counseling is, is what I would call intensive training and discipleship. Teaching people how to take addictions and behavioral issues and lay them before the Lord and bring the remedy of the Spirit, the remedy of the cross, the remedy of the Scripture into those situations with some of the tools that are necessary that it bring about deliverance so that we, 2 Corinthians 10, take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So this is, this is a, an area of, of profound need to me and, and, and something that I'm asking the Lord to help us with. Number three, worship arts and music. My prayer is that the Lord continue to develop the arts ministry in our church and in our campus. Not just music, not just the pageants, but a highly advanced arts ministry to reach the Bay Area and the Pacific Rim nations. trying to decide if I need to tell you something. I think I will. I am praying. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to pray. And knowing that people are, are watching, ask. I'm just going to put it out here, okay? I believe the Lord wants to bring about a new renaissance. I believe he wants to use the art and arts to take the gospel into places that have become immune to it, gotten used to it, and into places that are opposed to it. I believe the Lord wants to use the arts to help us win the Bay Area. Did you know that church attendance in the Bay Area is almost like Europe? It's very low. And it's, and it's something that, and, and it's higher in Oakland than in other parts of the Bay. Okay, but it's very low. And there's almost a cynicism. 
And, and we're going to talk about that when we, talk, when we deal with strategic anointing. But there's a cynicism. We need vibrant, anointed, now hear me, vibrant and anointed art that not, only, that not only moves the soul, but moves the spirit, that touches people in, in, in a deep place. And so we, we, we have to be far, far, far more expansive than we've been. Not just art in terms of visual things, but you've got to remember in, in the medieval times, art was something that, was, that, that, that told the story. The reason for stained glass is the illiteracy rate of churchgoers was high. And so the arts, the arts told the story. Well, see, we need things that tell the story to a culture that doesn't know the story. I'm going to say that again. We need things that tell the story to a culture that doesn't know the story. I'll say that again because you're not getting it. Your 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 hour deprivations catching up. Listen to it. <laughs> we need art that is so anointed that it tells the story to a culture that doesn't know the story. Okay, now you're starting to get it, or you're at least trying to humor me. Okay. <laughs> now, not just in the Bay Area, not just in. Our region, although the West Coast is very emphatically in my, in my spirit. This is what I hesitate. I'm going to say it. The principalities of Asia must fall. The principalities of Asia must fall. The principalities of Asia must fall. The Spirit resisted Paul, the apostle, from taking the gospel east into Asia. And the gospel went west into Macedonia. And it has gone west. Christendom covered the globe western. It went west into Europe. It went west into Africa. It went west into the United States uh, uh, when it developed into the new world. And the principalities of Asia have been profoundly resistant to the gospel of Jesus Christ. A hundred years ago, though, in Korea, particularly South Korea, less than 2% of the population were Christian. Now it is nearly 50% in a hundred years. OK, I believe that's a toehold. I believe that's a, a beachhead. OK, after World War II, Douglas MacArthur begged the church to send missionaries to Japan. And we didn't do it. And we didn't do it probably because we'd fought a war with them and were mad. I don't know. We didn't do it. And in 45... Japan, with, with an opportunity, they, their, their emperor worship had been destroyed. Would have been a great opportunity to present mercy and grace of Jesus. And by 49, China fell to communism. And that whole block, including South Asia, India, all of these places, the Middle East, all these demonic principalities must fall. To the gospel. Now, there's two ways we can reach them. We can send people there, but that, that doesn't work so well. Even when I go into India, you, 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 you're, you, you're cautious about places that they let me go. Okay? But there are two things we can do. One, art. Art travels well. Art travels very well. And two, education. I-20 students. People can come here from those places there, be educated here in a Christian church, a Christian setting with the gospel. And I just believe that the power of the gospel is so profound that if two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. And the power of the Lord is there. 
and, and I believe in my lifetime, should the Lord allow me to live about 30 years from now, I believe in my lifetime we will see a critical mass in that part of the world. Because the hidden church right now is under severe persecution there, but they can't stop it from growing. They can't stop it from growing. Thousands and thousands every single day are coming to Jesus Christ in Asia. The principalities of Asia have not fallen. But we have to do something that allows the gospel and the story of the gospel to be told to people who've never heard it in a way that allows it to be heard. Do this through music, do this through pageants, do this through visual arts, do it through graphic arts, do it through dramatic arts, do it through technical support, audio, visual, staging, everything that's associated with that. But we must have a highly advanced arts ministry as a tool to reach China, Asia, Oakland, and the entire Bay Area. And my prayer is that the Lord allows us to have a strong Christian-centered gospel ethic that becomes, but, but that we become known, not us personally, but the Lord becomes known here for the ministry of education and the ministry of arts. We have to commit ourselves to this. Number four, I'm gonna wrap this up here, I think, today. I, I was trying to get through all five, but I don't, I don't wanna to rush through these last parts, okay? But I'll let you think about them for the next couple weeks, the next week or so. Two other lanes is the pulpit ministry and church planting and development. 